Mr. President, uh, I rise today to join my colleagues in supporting the Disclose Act. I want to commend uh, Senator Blumenthal for his extraordinarily insightful and articulate words with respect to this critical issue. I particularly want to commend my colleague from Rhode Island, Senator Whitehouse. Um, he has been the driving force to bring this issue to the floor to uh, educate all of us in the Senate and the, the American people about what is at stake here. And in many respects, it's our democracy. It's uh, the presumption that every American has that their vote counts just as much as anybody else's vote, that elections are decided based upon issues and ideas and not the sheer volume and the sheer magnitude of 30-second advertisements which are designed more to divert than to inform, more than designed more to excite than to inform. Uh, most people believe in a the system which is based upon thoughtful consideration of ideas and issues, and everyone's vote counts. Uh, Senator Whitehouse is an extraordinarily gifted attorney. He understands these issues perhaps as well as anyone in this body. He was our federal attorney and our attorney general. And he's brought this, not just knowledge of the Constitution, uh, but this passion for justice and fairness and decency and democracy to the forefront of our debate today. And this will not be the last day, I think, we will be debating this issue. So let me begin by commending his efforts. A fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution is the right to vote. And each citizen uh, gets one vote, and this right represents a critical pillar of our democracy. Because we treat everyone equally, allowing each citizen to have this crucial and critical say in who governs, what are the issues, ultimately, what is the course of this great country. But I worry, because of the Supreme Court decisions in Citizens United, that our political and civic conversations now advantage those who flood our airways, papers, and websites by talking, if not shouting, louder simply because they have more money and resources to do so. The New York Times recently included the following in an article giving us one indication of how much money is awash in our political system. And it reflects what my colleague from Connecticut said. According to the Times, quote, during the 2010 midterm elections, tax-exempt groups outspent PACs, the traditional political action committees which have been in effect since the 70s, by a three to two margin, according to recent study by the Center for Responsive Politics and the Center for Public Integrity, with most of that money devoted to attacking Democrats or defending Republicans. And such groups have accounted for two thirds of the political advertising bought by the biggest outside spenders so far in the 2012 election cycle, according to Kantar Media's campaign media analysis group with close to $100 million in issue ads. Small group of anonymous individuals organized as corporate entities, not-for-profit corporate entities in some cases, $100 million. And the clock is tick still ticking and the amount is accumulating. That electioneering in the shadows is not what most Americans want. They want robust debate. They want candidates to engage as candidates, not through surrogates, not the witting or unwitting beneficiaries or victims of anonymous advertisements in their state, in their race. This is not, I believe, what uh, the creators of the Constitution thought would happen or hoped would happen. They envisioned, I think, one in which the best ideas, the best arguments, uh, prevailed regardless of how loudly one spoke, that it was uh, the quality of the argument, not the volume of the speaker. And what should be important is this quality of speech, not the quantity. And frankly, there's a direct cor correlation between the amount of money you have today and the, the quantity of your speech on the media. That's just the reality of paid advertising, which dominates political campaigns. 
But this vision, because of Citizens United, I think has been turned on its head. Now those with the greatest resources, the most money, have been given a disproportionate advantage. And they've been done given that advantage without the need to stand up to be accountable, to be known, to disclose what they've done, what they stand for, where the money's coming from, basically. And that anonymity is corrosive. By allowing corporations and unions and not-for-profits to unleash the full power of their treasury funds and explicitly advocating for the election or defeat of candidates in federal and state elections in the, names, in the name of protecting and promoting free speech, I think the Supreme Court missed the mark. Missed the mark about the centrality of an individual's vote and the substance of a campaign being about ideas, not about derogatory advertising, not about anything else except the issues. That's the ideal. That's what our founding fathers were hoping for and indeed, I think, expecting. And that, I think, has been terribly distorted by this opinion. There's an interesting sort of situation going on here. In, in the attempt to create under Citizens United what the Supreme Court, I expected, was hoping to do, create an atmosphere in which speech is free, they've created a situation in which uh, speech is no longer free. Effective speech is no longer free. It actually comes with a very high cost and goes to the person with, who is the highest bidder. That's not free speech, not effective free speech. It's purchase speech. And if our elections are going to be decided not by free speech but by purchase speech, They'll be won always by the highest bidder, by the person with the biggest wallet, the person who's willing to spend as much as necessary to prevail. And it will raise, and it does raise, the specter of, is this about the future of the country? Or is this about the narrow self-interest of someone who's willing to invest a great deal of money into a particular race? And I think most people would conclude it's probably about the narrow self-interest of someone who invests a great deal of money in a race. Simply put, I think Citizens United is deeply flawed, and, and more than one expert has voiced their frustration and disappointment with this decision. Shortly after the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Citizens United in 2010, Norm Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute, which is a center-right more right than center, perhaps, organization, wrote in a column in Royal Cole called, quote, court way oversteps its authority with Citizens United's case. These words. I hoped, he said, Citizens United would be decided narrowly, but feared that the court would take a meat ax to a century of settled law and policy. My worst fears were realized. This decision equates corporations which have one goal, to make money, with individual citizens who have many goals and motives in their lives, including making a better society, protecting their children and grandchildren, and future generations, and so on and so on. This was a case never raised by the plaintiffs and never formally brought before the Roberts Court. We do not have an instance where an actual for-profit corporation has complained that it has been barred from its ability to get its message across in the political process. The cases overturned and the laws struck down were considered carefully by judges and Congresses passed, including in the McConnell decision barely six years ago. Only one thing has changed since. The political and ideological complexion of the Supreme Court brought on, in particular, by the retirement of Sandra Day O'Connor. And those are the words of Norm Ornstein, one of the most respected political analysts uh, in this community and indeed, uh, probably in, the, in this nation. Additionally, Judge Richard Posner, a respected judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, who was appointed to the bench by President Ronald Reagan, recently stated the following on his blog. The court, rather naively as it seems to most observers, reasoned in Citizen United case that the risks of corruption would be slight if the donor was not contributing to a candidate or a political party 
but merely expressing his political preferences through an independent organization such as a super PAC, an organization neither controlled by nor even coordinating with a candidate or political party. He goes on. It is thus, it thus is difficult to see what practical difference there is between super PAC donations and direct campaign donations from a corruption standpoint. A super PAC is a valuable weapon for a campaign, as the heavy expenditures of Restore Our Future, the large super PAC that supports Romney and has the taxes opponents proves. The donors to it are known, and it is unclear why they should expect less quid pro quo from their favorite candidate if he's successful than a direct donor to the candidate's campaign would be. Now, Judge Posner, I think, is making the case very effectively. You know, if there are limits on a direct individual donor's contributions because there is an abiding suspicion, and the courts have confirmed, that you don't even want to create the appearance of a quid pro quo, the idea that a super PAC whose donors are all known uh, has less of an ability to influence a candidate and more, I think, significantly, not only a candidate, but perhaps an elected official, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't follow. I think Judge Parsons' comments are very on point in that this also invites the perception and perhaps the reality of inappropriate influence on candidates and on elected officials. And that was at a great deal at the heart of why we passed campaign reform legislation decades ago. Now, even these point of view by Noam Ornstein, by Judge Posner, have not unfortunately convinced my Republican colleagues to join us in effect in trying to correct the deficiency, which my able colleague from Van Eggett pointed out, was the fact that the case of citizens presumes this disclosure. Uh, we have tried to debate this legislation of variations many times before. Uh, we have taken even much more, I think, uh, s stronger action in previous versions. But today we're here in a good faith effort to meet our colleagues more than halfway. Uh, there are those who oppose previous versions of the, the CLOSE Act on the grounds that there were provisions unrelated to disclosure, that this is all about disclosure. But these concerns are addressed head on in this legislation crafted by my, co my colleague because it focuses solely on disclosure and it is effective after these, this fall's election. And so I would ask my colleagues, especially those who have said that they're all for disclosure, to join us, to join us to pass this legislation because it's all about disclosure. And let me go back to the language of the Supreme Court majority opinion quoted by Senator Blumenthal. Because they presume in the decision there would be full disclosure. And that's what we're asking for tonight on this, this floor. Give the court what it thought it had. A system by which the American public can know immediately who is putting all this money into the elections. In their words, prompt disclosure of the court in Citizens United. Prompt disclosure of expenditures can provide shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters. Shareholders can determine whether their corporation's political speech advances the corporate's interest in making profits, and citizens can see whether elected officials are, quote, in the pocket, close quote, of so-called moneyed interest. The First Amendment protects political speech, and disclosure permits citizens and shareholders to react to the speech of corporate entities in a proper way. This transparency enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to different speakers and messages. That's what the court said. And yet, if we don't pass this legislation, all of this is irrelevant because there is no disclosure. Because corporations can't make judgments about what their directors are investing in in terms of political activities. Individuals can't make judgments about 
the commercials they're seeing because they don't know who is behind them, really. So if we want to create the context which presumably undergirded the Supreme Court's decision, we have to pass this legislation. But if we want to ignore, indeed, what the court has said, ignore what our constituents have said, and allow this anonymous money to flood our elections, to raise doubt about the process, to undercut what traditionally people think is the American way, one person, one vote, it's about the issues, and let's have the election. So I urge my colleagues to support the Disclose Act. For that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor.